Hello viewer and welcome to the very first video of my YouTube channel, The Unwise Thinker. The title of this video is The Crown You Never Take Off, A History of Black Hair Through the Edges. In this video, I will be discussing the hurdles and hardships African people face, especially women, due to something they were born with, their natural hair. We are going to travel through time to understand where it all began how it evolved throughout the centuries, how we got to where we are today, and what we should expect from the future. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the video. We are going to start with a little bit of history. In the Western world, Afro-textured hair has historically been treated with disdain by members of all ethnicities. It was seen as being unprofessional, unattractive, and unclean. Black women have been conditioned to believe their natural hair, the hair that grows directly out of their scalps, was unruly and unkempt, with the ideal beauty type in most Western countries being that of someone with silky straight hair. Black women have often been left to feel like their natural hair is innately negative. These restrictive ideals have left black women in a compromised position, having to adhere to certain societal norms for the sake of upward mobility, whether that's getting ahead professionally or fitting in a myriad of social environments such as school. As we've seen countless times, black women are sometimes punished or shamed if they choose to do otherwise. And a good example of this is the case of Pretoria Girls High School in South Africa, whose discriminatory code of conduct sparked protest from its students in 2016 due to its language that implied Afro-textured hair the Black is Lives messy. Matter movement. The schoolgirls are saying the school management allegedly threatened them. We staged a peaceful demonstration because Today, they stated they wanted a blackout, blackout Thursday in support of Black Lives Matter. So, our response to them was that if you claim to support the hashtag Black Lives Matter movement, how do you say you support the church to perpetuate the same system that the Black Lives Matter movement is against? And so we asked them, we asked them, and so when we staged the protest, they did what they did in 2016. They threatened us. They threatened us once again, and they called they called a member from the GDE just now. And now, let's take a quick look back in history. During the 15th and 16th centuries, the Atlantic slave trade saw black Africans forcibly transported from sub-Saharan Africa to North America, and upon their arrival in the New World, their heads would be shaved in effort to erase their culture, since many Africans used hairstyles to signify their tribal identity, marital status, age, and other personal characteristics. Early on, both men and women would wear headscarves to protect their scalps from sunburn and lice. But as time progressed, these hair wraps became more associated with women who began to wear them in various fashions based on their region and personal style. During the early 1700s, when the slave trade was still in place, black hair was dehumanized and described as wool by white people. This is when the concept of good hair arose in the times leading up to the abolition of slavery in the United States. This concept created a damaging narrative that would shape the way black hair was viewed for centuries to come. Good hair was associated with Caucasian textures softer, smoother, lighter, and longer. Meanwhile, black hair textures were considered bad. Enslaved people who worked in the home did not wear headscarves as field laborers did. And as they were often children of a white man in the family that owned them, 
they were more likely to have straight hair than kinky or curly hair. This was done for convenience and to conform with Western beauty standards. In the late 1700s, free Africans in New Orleans were able to buy their freedom from slavery, resulting in an increase of interracial marriage in Louisiana. In response to this, Charles III of Spain demanded Louisiana colonial governor Esteban Rodriguez Miró to establish public order and proper standards of morality, with specific reference to a large class of mulattoes and particularly mulatto women. It is believed that the reason behind it was the fact that Louisiana women of African descent wore hairstyles that incorporated feathers and jewels, which caught the attention of white men, creating a certain jealousy and animosity from white women. To comply with Charles III's demand, Miro issued an edict that required Creole women to wear a tignon in public places by law to conceal their hair. The law was intended to stop these interracial unions. Women did comply with the law, however, in an act of resistance, they would adorn their wraps with fine fabrics and jewelry, which would make them stand out even more. As time progressed, the influence of Western beauty standards started to appear amongst the black community, and by the late 800s, African-American women started to straighten their hair to meet the Eurocentric vision of society. To do this, they would use hot combs. At the time, it was simply a heated metal comb that was designed to straighten and smooth kinky and coarse afro hair textures, starting from the roots upwards. While many women, including white women, used hot combs to straighten their hair for various reasons, the tool gave black women the chance to have the so-called good hair they were taught since childhood they didn't have. Straight hair was not only deemed more attractive, but it elevated a woman's personal, social and economic status and could even result in more opportunities for success. One of the pioneers of this comb and other beauty products was Madame C.J. Walker. She was an African-American entrepreneur, philanthropist, and political and social activist. She is recorded as the first female self-made millionaire in America in the Guinness Book of World Records. Walker made her fortune by developing and marketing a line of cosmetics and hair care products for black women through the business she founded. Madame C.J. Walker Manufacturing Company. Through her company, she was able to hire many women that she trained as licensed agents and taught them the Walker system. Her employees earned nice commissions which allowed these women to become financially independent. She even built the mansion where she resided with African-American labor and it was designed by an African-American architect. Throughout her life, she fought for the rights of African Americans and donated large sums of money to help the progress of her people. At the time of her death, on May 25, 1919, she was considered the wealthiest African American businesswoman and the wealthiest self-made black woman in America. In her will, she donated the third of her wealth to various charities. In the early 19th century, when enslaved men and women were no longer being brought from Africa, the quality of life slightly increased for them as they became more valuable for their owners. Now enjoying Sundays off, black women would take the day to style their hair and cover it for church services on Sunday, but keeping it wrapped Monday through Saturday. Everything changed in the 60s and 70s with the Black Pride movement as it made the Afro a popular hairstyle among African Americans and it was considered a symbol of resistance, rebellion, pride and empowerment.
Fast forward 40 years and we are now in the 2010s. During this time, natural hairstyles saw an increase in popularity in response to various black celebrities who decided to wear the natural hair. However, the popularity also resulted in increased attention to dress codes and hair regulations as African American workers and students across the US and other countries were subjected to punishment due to their hair. Because of awareness to this issue, the US state of California passed the Crown Act in July 2019, which is the acronym for Create a Respectful and Open Workplace for Natural Hair. Hair discrimination has and continues to be one of many controversial inequities members of the black community face in schools and workplaces across the U.S. Many people have sacrificed education, jobs, and other opportunities due to discriminatory dress codes and hair policies. Now the Crown Act, first passed in California, is one step closer to becoming a federal law. It would prohibit schools and workplaces from discriminating against a person's hairstyle, such as locks, braids, twists, and knots. Companies like UPS are already changing their long-standing restrictions on beards and natural hairstyles. So for more on the challenges that black women... This was the first legislation passed at the state level in the United States to prohibit such discrimination, and it was passed unanimously in both chambers of the California legislature by June 27, 2019, and it was signed into law on July 3, 2019. With this act, California became the first U.S. state to prohibit discrimination against workers and students based on their natural hair. It is a step forward, but in reality, straightened hair is still considered today the more professional hairstyle in the workplace across countries with African descendants of the diaspora. There is still a lot of work to do to make sure future generations of black women won't have to go through the same struggles as their ancestors did and as many black women still do today. The hope is that every black woman will embrace her blackness, love the hair she was born with and will wear her afro proudly. Black hair tells the story of our heritage, it dictates the trends of today and speaks to our resilience as black people as we move towards the future. It will continue to be a symbol of strength, illuminating our identities however we choose to wear our crown. So, I've talked about the history of the Afro hair and the laws to prevent discrimination against it. Legally, black women wearing their natural hair are certainly more protected today. However, peer pressure still exists in Western society. And part of dismantling this bias is by educating ourselves and others about the history of black hair, something we can only scratch the surface of within this video. Now. Because of an increase in diverse representation, things are finally starting to change. To have black women in roles of power and influence empowers every black girl to choose how she wants to wear her hair. And whether that's kinky, curly or straight, every black girl should be able to make that decision freely and without judgment or pressure. It also ensures that conversations are had and ideally that policies nationwide will continue being implemented. That will be all from me today. Thank you if you watched the video to the end. Hopefully you learned something new. And please don't hesitate to leave your comments down below. I would love to have your thoughts on this topic. Maybe something I left out, something I should have added to the video or some of the facts within the video that I should correct. General feedback, everything would be great. 
If you like the video and you would like to see more, please subscribe because I will be posting videos regularly about general knowledge and different topics about the black community. That's all for me today. Thank you and see you in the next video. Bye.